This year we're looking at the book of 1 Corinthians under the title AD, the year of the Lord. Our world is obsessed with chasing our dreams and following our ideas and feelings. But instead of being fulfilled, we're struggling and wasting our time. We need a Lord, someone we respect, who can tell us what's true and how to live. May these messages inspire you to try. Yeah, praise God. Why don't we look into the Word of God today? What did I do with my clicker? Oh, yeah. I noticed in the AGM picture I was dressed exactly the same. <laughs> so, so you can see the rotation of the outfits, uh, how often they come back. Uh, we were talking this year about how it's the year of the Lord. And we're, we were talking about this surprising idea that, that Jesus, who is Lord, would actually be Lord of our lives. All right? And I know that that shouldn't be a shock, especially among Christians that uh, we actually should probably, when we sign up to the idea of being a Christian, that we do come into relationship with Jesus, and He is our Lord. Now, the reason that it's kind of a shock to us is that we've lived so long without a Lord, we don't know how to. Like, we just, we don't know what it's like to have somebody else directing our lives and involved in our lives. And so, wh what that means is that as we learn to submit to Jesus as Lord, there's a lot of struggles along the way. And so, what we've been talking about this month is about how God puts helpers alongside of us so we can learn to listen to and follow His leading in our lives. And we're calling those, this month, we're just calling those spiritual mentors and how important they are to us. We're reading 1 Corinthians and talking about all of the difficulties of the Corinthian church had when it comes to following Christ as Lord. And the, one of the things that he has to correct them is he says, you guys are acting like a bunch of teenagers who think you know everything, but you don't. You're actually in need of a spiritual mentor who's like a father. Well, he says it like this. He says, I don't write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children, for though you have countless guides in Christ, you don't have many fathers, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel and I urge you then, be an imitator of me. And so Paul wants to correct these guys and say, listen, you're, you're actually losing touch with probably one of the best anchor points you'll ever have in your life to learn to follow God. And he says, it's somebody who knows God's voice more. I'm like a father to you. I took the gospel to you, and then you became my spiritual children, and now you've got these other people who want to tell you stuff. And they're blah, blah, don't listen to Paul, don't listen to what he's got to say, and they're influencing you. So can you see this? There's good mentors and there's bad mentors. Can you see him talking about that? So this was a big problem for the Corinthian church. They had a great mentor in Paul, but they weren't paying attention to him. And then they had all of these other people that loved to tell them what to do all of the time, and they were struggling to know, well, what's a good mentor and what's a bad mentor? So we've been talking about that all this month. The mentors that we're supposed to have in our lives are like this. They should be like fathers, not bosses. Like fathers care for us so that we grow up. They don't take the place of authority in our lives. They teach us to follow the authority of God and submit to Him. Whereas bosses love to be the person in charge of us. Problem, they leave us immature. They don't let us grow. The second thing we talked about is how we need to have them like mothers, full of love and sacrifice, because there's lots of people who are willing to just chat, 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 say, 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 but it, when it, who you should listen to comes down to who's going to care for you the most, or here's how you tell about care, who puts up with you the most. The people who put up with you the most are actually the people who love you the most, and you should listen to those who put up with you more than those other people who talk, 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 and have got plenty to say. And what we're going to talk about today is this verse here, is this idea. They need to be like shepherds, not hirelings. And the reason I'm saying that is because that's something that Jesus said that was different about himself. He says this, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand, and he cares nothing for the sheep. Now, let, let me just sort of bring you into this idea. Jesus is talking about the difference between him and every other spiritual advisor in the world. Jesus didn't enter the world, and nobody had been talking about God, and there was no religions. When Jesus entered the world, there was thousands of religions, all kinds of ways of thinking about God and talking about His will and understanding Him. You know that. I know that. There's all around us, there's all kinds of people who think things about God. 
So Jesus comes into the world and he says, I'm the good shepherd. All of those other people that came before me, they would not die for the sheep. So the reason you should listen to me is because I'm taking the full load. I mean, one of the major differences between Christianity and every other religion is our leader died for us. He died for us. Buddha didn't die for the Buddhist. Muhammad didn't die for Islam. Jesus died for us. My, my, when I was in Bible college, a funny thing happened. Uh, we had this guy who's actually Australian uh, in my class. Uh, his name was Peter. And he was like one of those out, where, out there evangelists. You know, he'd been on YWAM and just, you know, just super evangelists all the time. So we had one class on comparative religions where we all had to pick a religion and do a project, a presentation about that particular religion. So, and then compare what is different between that and Christianity. And so this guy, Peter, he thought, I got a great idea for my presentation. I'm going to get the lead person in the city, and this is in Vancouver, the lead person in the city from that religion to come and talk to the students. I thought, this guy is... So, this, so his, uh, Peter's doing his presentation, and he's like, and inviting in. And this guy comes in with the long clerical robes and the hat, and he was from, I don't know, I think he was from Pakistan initially, or maybe it was North India, I don't know, but he was, he was, he was all dressed very much in the Swami kind of looking kind of way with the long beard and everything, and we're like, all righty then, and he, and he thought, we're going to get him saved, we're, he's going to become a Christian, like, so anyway, so he does this presentation, and he's being very serious, you got to imagine, this is a serious room, and we're trying to tone down the other judgmental, aggressive Christians in the room to not just attack him all the time, but just let the man talk. And so he's telling us about why he believes in his faith so much. And so he explained the foundations of the faith. He had this dynamic guru, and the reason that this guru was known to be the right guy is because he had these 10 devoted followers. And what happened, he said, on this special day when he was releasing this new religion, and he had these 10 most devoted followers. He took them one by one into a tent where he beheaded them. And he killed them one by one. And those were the 10 martyrs. And the reason why we should trust in what he was teaching is because these martyrs believed so much that they were willing to die for their leader. And I thought... You see, we got a kind of a reversey reversey on that one in Christianity. You know what I'm saying? Like, Jesus doesn't take us into the tent and kill us. Jesus goes in the tent and dies for us. Do you get what I'm saying? It's kind of like, so you're saying we should believe because look at the devotion of the person that was dumb enough to die versus the guy who went, listen, nobody else can do this for you, so I'm going to do the job for you. I'm going to die on your behalf. Now, Jesus says himself, that's how you know I'm credible. It's because I don't stop short of what you need. I'm not like a hireling. I'm not just here to gain something. I'm here for you, and I'm willing to share your fate. Yeah. Now, as we've been talking about this, this month, I was thinking that it's time for us to have a chat about this. A lot of our lives, we ask the question, what's in it for me? I probably, if I was to go through a list of the decisions that you've made in your life, probably a lot of them have been based on this, what's in it for me. I know for sure that you got married with what's in it for me on your mind. You thought, I, I, this person is going to help me, fulfill me, make me happy, and so I'm going to marry this person. And you turn out that they don't make you happy and they don't fulfill you, and you're actually <laughs> used by God to build them up. But, and they, but you get sucked into it because you think, what's it? The people who have children all think, what's in it for me? Uh, I'll have a lovely baby. It'll be so nice. You don't think, I get to stay up all night. My life is ruined. My body is stretched out. I, uh, you, know, you, you know, they eat all our stuff, and 20 years later, we just argue all the time. Like, it's not, it's not, you don't think, what's in it? We all think, what's in it for me in all these decisions that we do? And I think that that's one of the problems if Christianity is that when we enter Christianity, we enter with a what's in it for me mentality. I know I did. My life sucked. I was going nowhere. I, was, I had made an absolute mess of my whole life, and I needed spiritual life and change. And I heard that Jesus could do that. So when I signed up to Christianity, it was for what's in it for me. 
Now, of course, Jesus has made sure that it didn't stay about me, but when I started, I started out with what's in it for me. And this is the problem about people, is that we are oftentimes like that, and I'll tell you who knows that the most. It's Satan. In the book of Job, Satan is having a conversation with God, the Lord. And God's saying, look at Job. Job does everything right. He constantly does what pleases me. And Job, uh, Job is blessed in his life. He has so much. I mean, here's the thing. If you follow God, if you trust Jesus, your life will be blessed. Absolutely, 100%, it gets better. Now, but here's the question. Would you follow him if it got worse? You see, that's what Job, that's what Satan thinks. It, the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there's none like him on the earth, blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around his house and all that he has on every side, and you've blessed him in the work of his hands, and the possessions have increased in the land? But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he'll curse you to your face. Yeah, well, and listen... Have you not heard stories about people who turned away from God because their life got difficult? Sickness, illness, tragedy, loss of income or possessions. People who were devoted to God as long as God was going to give them stuff. But as soon as God didn't do that, they're like, hey, I'm only in this for what's in it for me. And so that idea of what's in it for me becomes a clouding issue when it comes to spiritual advisors. Whether it's the kind of advisors we are or the kind of advisors we want. So we need to ask ourselves the question, what are the motivations of those who advise me and those I advise? I mean, think about this. When I was uh, 18 years old, I, uh, I felt the call of God to go to Bible college. I didn't know I was gonna be a pastor, but I just felt, I gotta go to Bible college. I gotta learn this Bible. I can't figure out how to live unless I know more of the Bible. And my best mate at the time, named Darren, we both said the same thing. We just want to go to Bible college. We don't care. We're 18 years old. We're graduating from high school. We're going to Bible college. We were so excited about going to Bible college that we both jumped in my car and drove from my hometown to Calgary, which is about an eight-hour drive, so that we could go to a Bible college. We took a couple of days off school without asking. Not a good idea. And we drove to a whole other city, sat through Bible college classes to get a feel for it, hung around with the Bible college students afterwards, went to church events in the place, and just thought, we're going to Bible college. God's will is to go to Bible college. And I went home and I told my mom, Mom, I know you've been expecting me to go to university. And I, like, uh, I was probably the, the first person in our family line that was close enough to get to university, had a good GPA, and, or you know, that's what we call ATARs. Or, is that the word? Yeah. Okay. A good GPA. I could boast and tell you what it was, but it was high. <laughs> and they were all expecting me to go to university. And I said, Mom, I'm going to go to Bible college. And my mom went, I could hear her thinking, that's not going to make me happy. But she went, yeah, Joe, if you think that's God's will, you'd do that. My, um, my best mate went and told his parents. And his dad said, you're going to university. I know you think that that's God's will for you to go to Bible college, but you're not going. You're going to university. Because in, in their hearts, they had always wanted their son to go to university. So they sent him to university, and he spent three years there wasting his time until finally his parents agreed that he could stop and go to Bible college. And today he's a pastor, and a great pastor, because God had always intended for him to go to Bible college. But let me ask you this. If you were a parent and your child was coming to you, do you think that you could clear your motivations for what you desired for your kids so that they were able to do what God wanted and not what you wanted? Would that be challenging to you? Think about this. What if your 21-year-old son comes to you and says, I've met somebody. They live in Australia. Well, for you, that's not harsh because that's here. <laughs> But for my mom, that was thousands of miles away. I mean, I was internationally shopping for the only girl in the world that could put up being married to me, found her on another continent, before the internet. Right, so that's like old. 
Old. That's the old section. Sorry, Aaron's already in trouble for that. Uh, so uh, how do you think, how would you go as a parent when your child says to you, I think that it's the will of God for me to go and live in another country, and by the way, you won't see me from this point on very often. Would you struggle with your motivations? Would you struggle not to interpret the will of God for them and, and guide them? It's, listen, motivations are always at work in all of the things that we're doing. And where it's oftentimes very hard for us to separate us from what God is saying. But a good spiritual mentor learns to separate their ideas, their desires, from what's good for you. So, a couple of things that we got to watch out for in spiritual influence. There's a lot of people who are asking this question, does it make me look important? You know, in the Jewish community of the time, Jesus brings up a point about the Jewish leaders of that time. The people that were called scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law, they were all the religious professionals, and they got something out of that. What's in it for them was that they got to look important. It says, Jesus said, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. They make their phylacteries, which is not like a pterodactyl kind of thing. You know, I know it sounds a bit prehistoric. A phylactery is a pterodactyl that says, no, it's a, it was a, a box that they would tie to their right hands or their forehead that they would put scripture verses in. So remember, keep the right, keep your, the word of God on your right hand. And then we tie them to their foreheads as well. And the long ribbon that tied it there, either to their head or to their arm, was the um, the, they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes or the tassels long. And they love the place of honor at the feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeting in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. Now, can I just give you a, just a little bit of warning? A lot of people try to get their sense of worth by making themselves important in your life. Your sense of self-esteem comes from God. When God says He loves you, He thinks you're great, He loves who you are and values you, that is all you need. You don't need other people to say you're awesome and we think you're awesome because you're important and do all this kind of stuff. But listen, I know a lot of people who are in spiritual roles in people's lives, leadership roles, and they do it because it makes them feel important. They feel better about themselves to be able to tell other people what to do and have other people come to them and listen to their advice and to be in that position where they're kind of made to feel better about themselves because of how other people treat them. So can I just advise you in this? Don't help people because it makes you look good. And also be questioning the motivations of other people who are really just trying to elevate themselves as an important person. The second thing that I think we need to ask is, um, will it make me money? I know that you're right now, you're going, of course I would never listen to anybody that was just trying to make money off me. I know you would think that because you're so smart. This, this situation comes from a spiritual leader that they encountered in a place called Samaria, and the person named Simon in the story is Simon the Sorcerer. And Simon the sorcerer was a person of great spiritual influence in the community in which he lived. He was probably played the role of a witch doctor or somebody that had sort of this access to something that they called the divine power or the great power. And so as, as uh, these Peter and John come and preach in Samaria, Simon notices that these guys have gotten more of the God stuff and his disciples are leaving and following these guys. So Simon, it says... They laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone whom I lay my hands can receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Now, why does Simon want this power? He wants the power because if he buys the power to give the Holy Spirit, then people will come to him and he can charge them money to give them the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we would know that we would never just listen to anybody who was just trying to make money off us, don't we? Have you ever bought a book because it offered you advice for a successful life? 
you gave money to somebody to tell you what to do. Just saying. A little, a little while ago, there was this lady, an Australian lady. She wrote a book, went worldwide. It was called The Secret. I don't know if you saw that. Big fancy letter S. It was quite popular about 15 years ago. Went around the world. It was even on Oprah. You know, which is a great place to plug your spiritual advisor books. So she found the secret. You know, the secret was if you just believe it strong enough, it's going to come to you. So whatever you, whatever is in your heart, whatever good vibes you got going, whatever got good thoughts you got going, that's the good thing that's going to come to you. And this fantastic secret, which is that you can bring good things to your life if you just believe it. And it worked for her. Because she believed that if she put this book out there, that a lot of people would pay a lot of money to buy her book and she would get rich. And it happened just like she believed. <laughs> well, like I'm, I'm mocking the idea, but have you ever watched a religious presentation where at some point in the show they wanted to give you a product for money to help you? Now, there is so much financial incentive based around spiritual advice that you have to be careful about it. We all have to be careful about why people are saying this. Our, 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 the leader of the, the CRC churches in Australia, Bill Vasilakis, at the last conference, he was promoting some of the books that he'd written, and you could sit there going, uh -huh, writing a book, making some cash. But so he disclosed, I don't make any money off these books. Do you pay for this book? Yes, it's more than the cost of the publishing, but every cent more just means I can print more books to give away when I'm on the missions field. So he might sell a couple hundred here in Australia so that he can give away thousands when he's in countries that can't afford books. But he said, I don't make a cent off any of these books. Now, to me, that's a sign of authenticity. This guy is not trying to get something off me. He's trying to invest in people's lives. That means his advice is probably worth listening to. All right? So the other thing is, will it give me control? Um, Paul writes to Timothy talking about certain people that were spreading themselves around the church. He says, they have an appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins, and led astray by various passions, always learning, and never able to arrive at the truth, just as... Now, these two names are the names of the Egyptian, um, you know, magic doers that were in the court when Pharaoh and Moses were having their conversation. Remember, Moses did his miracles, and then the Egyptian wizards would do the same thing. Now, amazingly, they had Spanish names, Yanis and Yambres. No, just, are you guys laughing today? Oh, there you go. So, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. So can I just tell you this? There are often people in your world that just love to control you. There's, there has been people who have come into this church that they love to get disciples around them that seem like they want to be led and be told what to do. And so they've come in and they've tried to just sort of corral them into their little small group where we be, they become dependent on this spiritual mentor and leader so that they can tell them what to do and command them in certain things. And then they, what they love to do is put obligations on them so it's harder to follow and they have to work extra hard, which means that you need the leader more because this person is the only one with the answers. And their desire is simply to get control over people. Now, can you just listen to me? You are going to come across people in your life whose desire simply is to control you. That is an offense against God. You were made by God to follow God. And no other person is meant to be in a place, a position of manipulation and control in your life. And any person who takes that position is doing something offensive towards God. When we find people doing that here, we boot them. We're hunting for the wolves because we don't want any of that kind of behavior. We do not want people here controlling any other person. You are supposed to be free in Christ so that you can serve Christ. And here's, but here's the problem. You can develop a spiritual sickness in your life if you let other people poison that relationship. 
And there's a lot of people who end up in a kind of bondage because they feel then dependent on these other people to tell them what to do. You are meant to be free and mature. So the way of the world, though, is like this. We hire coaches. We buy books. We pay to attend seminars. And the basic idea is this. We, we value what we pay for. Have you ever heard that say? We value what you pay for. You know, somebody offers you advice that you didn't ask for. How do you treat it? You know, it's worthless. You know, if you don't pay anything for something, if you don't worry. Now, here's the problem. That thinking of we value what we pay for translates into our relationships with our spiritual mentors. And here's how it happens. Um, I want to explain to you a situation from 2 Corinthians that Paul has a problem with the Corinthians. Can, can I just have a few, few seconds to explain something that might sound boring, but it's important? Okay, Paul, an apostle who travels church to church, obviously needs to be supported in some way. Sometimes he pays his own way, sometimes other churches pay for him, and then sometimes he depends on the churches he's going to to support him. Most of the time, that's what he does. He works among them, and they care for his needs. But at the Corinthian church, in the city of Corinth, he did something that he didn't do before. He relied on a different church, the Macedonian church, to supply his needs while he worked with them. And he said this created a problem because here's a guy who's working to serve them and he's getting nothing. The problem is they change how they relate to him. So he says this, did I commit a sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained, and I will refrain from burdening you in any way. Now, here's the problem. This is not happening in isolation. He's not just going and serving him, and he's the only servant. There's other people who have come into town, and they're acting super-duper important. They, they call them, in quotes, super apostles, as if you can get higher than the Apostle Paul. Oh, yeah, sure, you can raise the dead, but, you know, I'm good at controlling the weather. Like, what? How do you get? So anyway, they're like, Paul goes in there, he's doing all this work, and he travels somewhere else, and these other guys come in there, and they start acting like they're better than this Corinthian people. Now, here's the problem. They listen to those guys more than Paul. You would think, what's the matter with you? Well, he says this. Paul says, for you bear it if somebody makes slaves of you, devours you, takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we're too weak for that. I'm not doing that. Can you imagine what it's like? Here's the thing. Suppose I come and I, Ashley, I'm here to serve you. I'll do anything for you. What is, you didn't have a certain needs. Let, let me get you. Do you hungry? I'll just get you some food. It sounds like that. Maybe you can stay at my house. And also you got some extra. So when, when I put myself under him, he ends up elevating above me. Right? Now, if I come to Ashley and say, why are you sitting down in my presence? You shouldn't be sitting around me. I need a special place to sit. Have you taken care of my food or my needs? I need a special green room. And you know, you know to make me feel more important. And I need to have people take care of my needs. Can you groom my hair and take care of me? And I went home the other day and my kitchen wasn't even clean. So what are you treating me like that? Now, here's what happens. When I make myself greater than Ashley, it puts in a position where he starts to treat me like I'm better than him. Do you see the problem? See, now Paul says, I came and I served you, I washed your feet, I gave my life for you, and you treated me like I was of little value, because that's the way the world thinks. And you need to realize that true spiritual mentors lift you up. They don't demand you and lord over you. But these Corinthians, they were tricked. And now, can I just say, there's a lot of this going on. True spiritual leaders wash your feet. They don't demand that you wash theirs. So, Paul advises and he says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night and day to admonish you, every one of you with tears, saying, watch out, not everybody has the right motivations. So, Peter writes to the elders, and can I say this to you who serve in our church in some way? 
If you are leading in some way, this is a command for how you ought to think about your role in other people's lives. He says this, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. So Paul, or Peter writes to the elders of the church and he says, get your motivations right. This is the church of Jesus Christ. Shepherd them. Be shepherds. Don't be hirelings. Don't do it so that you get something. Do it so that you can bless people. And when it comes to motivations, it's not about money. It's not about control. It's not about being important. It's about Jesus. You know what I love when people serve? You know, when we, we talk about people serving in the church, we're always going to sell you on the what's in it for you. Get involved in kids' ministry. You'll love making a difference in their lives. You'll love their happy, smiling faces. and You'll pray with them, and you'll be just so delighted. You know. Get involved in the worship team. You can create. You can just worship and love, and it'll be so fantastic. You know, get involved in greeting. You'll meet so many people. <laughs> Who go into the kitchen? You know, everybody loves it when their gifts are appreciated. And get in there and use your gift, and you'll just feel so good about yourself each day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all about you. And then this beautiful thing happens. It's called people. <laughs> Somewhere along the line, these people who got involved in kids' ministry because they just wanted to make a difference and feel important. And the kids will be so horrible and snotty and terrible and bite them and go crazy. And they'll say something to themselves like, this isn't working out for me at all. I'm, in fact, I'm just, oh, I can hardly stay around, but I guess I'll stay for you rotten kids. I think, yes, this is so beautiful. We're finally not doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for someone else. That's the moment that Paul is looking for in these elders. Don't do it because you get anything, nothing. You give up your time, your energy, your love, your compassion. Do it for them. Why? Because one day Jesus will reward it, and that's enough. The chief shepherd who shepherds you, that's what he wants you to do, so that's what you should do. And that is the true motivation of people that you should be depending on. Like Jesus said, he's a good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand is not a shepherd does not, and does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming, and he leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I want to tell you today about Jesus. Jesus is the perfect shepherd. Now, a lot of people think about Jesus in terms like he's a hired hand, that he's only going to be around when things are working out for him, or that he's only going to be involved in your life. And if you start to blow it, if you make mistakes, if you sin, if you goof up, well, then he's just going to hightail it because why would he hang around with you? You're not doing the right thing. Can I tell you this about my friend Jesus? Jesus is the one that when your life is at its worst, he wants to be in your world. He wants to be fighting your battles with you. If you're facing demonic problems, he wants to be there taking the punch for you. If you're dealing with temptation, he wants to be the wall that guards you. If you're dealing with stuff where you are sinful and ashamed and guilty, he wants to be there lifting you up so that you know that you're okay. When you have a problem, Jesus runs to you, not from you. And so a lot of people here today, I want you to know this. You should put your trust in Jesus. You should let him be your Lord because the rest of the world does not care about you at all. The good time friends and the people who do things around you, almost every one of them has a reason, has a motivation. They are not there for you. They are there for themselves. But Jesus is always going to be there for you and you should give him your life and you should trust him. And if you've run from him for any reason in any way, then you should stop running away from your shepherd. He only wants to help you. Let him come, come to him. He says his rod and his staff, they comfort me. The discipline and the correction of God helps you find your feet. But don't run. Don't ever run from the shepherd. So let's pray. Our Father, we're so grateful that Jesus is our perfect good shepherd. 
that he wouldn't flee just because things are hard. In fact, when we were at our worst, Christ died for us. Father, I pray that you would put that understanding in our spirit that Jesus Christ is a faithful shepherd who serves us, who takes care of us, and who loves us. And he will never abandon us and never forsake us because it is his character to fight for us and not just give up when times are tough. He truly shares our fate in every decision that we make, in all the things happening in our lives. Jesus shares our faith, and we are so grateful for that. I want to challenge you right now where you are. Are you close to God? Are you letting Jesus shepherd you? Have you found yourself that you've run away from God or that you've been standing on the outside wondering, why would I follow this God? What's he like? And today you can hear his Holy Spirit calling you close again, calling you to him, saying, come and trust me. Lay down your life with me. I've already laid down my life for you. Come and let me be your shepherd. Some people here today, I really believe that you're going to turn back to God in this moment and you're going to say, Father, forgive me for not trusting you. Is that you right now? Do you need to return to God? Why don't you come back to him? He's not going to be angry at you. He's not going to abuse you. He's only ever loved you. Just come back to him and say, Father, today I return to you. I come back to the sheepfold. I come back to you as my shepherd. I put my trust in you again, and I pray that you forgive me for wandering away from you. Forgive me for not trusting you. Father, today I return to you with my whole heart, and I pray that you forgive my sins, forgive my wandering spirit, and Lord, help me to stay following you for the rest of my life. Other people here today, I know that God is he's trying to bring you close to Him. You have an, an outsider relationship with God. You talk about Him, you think about Him, but you don't know Him. And right now, God wants you to have a relationship with Him. He is the, he is the good shepherd who lays down His life for you. And right now, you feel that tug in your heart that's saying, this is the one I should be trusting if there is God, if there is any kind of God, I would want him to be like Jesus. Well, Jesus is real, and he's here right now. And if you, if you have the faith, you can reach out to him and say, I want to know you. So if that's you today, why don't you just open up your heart and pray with me and invite Jesus into the lordship position of your life. You say, Jesus, come into my heart. I pray you forgive my sins, forgive me from wandering away. Forgive me for, for all the things that I've done wrong, but I know that you are a God that forgives. And so I come to you and I thank you that through your death on the cross, you have forgiven my sins and have given me new life. So I pray that you come into my heart and fill my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. I come to you today humbly and ask that I can come into your family. And I thank you that you accept me right now even as I pray. Jesus, I pray that you would fill people with your presence and your Holy Spirit to let them know that you are God and that you love them and that they're your child. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Why don't we stand to our feet? Let's respond to the Lord and his love for us by expressing our love for him and our, our thanks and gratitude for his careful ways in our lives.